I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. This is how stand-up fucks with your head. I remember doing a show here and dying. The minute I walked into this room, that's the first thing that I remembered. So those things stay with you so deeply. When you die on stage, it is so deep in your bones that I still now, 35 years later, remember that walking into this room. I think people don't realize that. They think, um, and they always give advice like, oh, take the good with the bad. You have to treat one like the other with equanimity. But when you bomb or die, it's like the audience is rejecting you personally. Your, your, your <laughs> inner being, your soul, your everything that you are is being completely rejected. Yeah. Richard Pryor was, to me, the first person I ever saw as a stand-up who just went on stage and just opened, ripped his guts open and his heart and just let it all out there. And that was so inspiring to me as a comedian because that, to me, that was always my goal is to just open myself in a way that left me completely vulnerable to them rejecting me. But luckily, more often than not, they didn't. <laughs> uh, this was something we were looking forward to a long time. Okay, I'm here. Yes, years. So excited to have Susie Esman on the podcast, who's most known for playing Susie Green on Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, one of the main stars of Cooper Enthusiasm, but you've been on a ton of TV, movies, and you've been doing stand-up comedy since like 1982. 83. You know, 83. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> you have this uh, great book, which I which we wrote in 2009, What Would Susie Say? Bullshit Wisdom About Love, Life, and Comedy. And Wait a actually, minute, I wrote that 10 years ago? 10 years Jesus. ago. Jesus. You wrote it longer. It was published in 2009. You probably wrote yeah, it in 2008. Well, yeah, exactly. Jeez. <laughs> Where does the time go? <laughs> so that must mean you're married like uh, 11 years now. Yeah, almost. Congratulations. Thank you. We're together longer, but yeah. And, 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 and actually happily married. That's really good. What do you think is the secret? Um, late love. Yeah, okay. I think late love is good. We just got married. Oh, mazel tov. Yeah, and so <laughs> we're in our 50s. Yeah, so late love. late love is like the, you know... Love is sunnier the second time around. Or third. <laughs> I'll or fourth. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you, I had a podcast with Judy Bloom right after my second marriage. And I said to her before the podcast, I said, I feel like I'm broken goods. I'm like two marriages. Right. And she said, listen to me, I defined your entire childhood, correct? And I said, yes, Judy Bloom, because you have to say her whole name. Right. Yes, Judy Bloom, you did. And she said, okay, I'm on my third marriage and it's 30 years going and it's great and third time's a charm. Not that, uh, not that third this time has to be a charm. This is my first time. I but think at, but you're at right, least about the 50s. You, you come with no baggage, literally. What, what do you mean? 
Do you don't have any? Uh, you don't own any objects. Oh, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's true. You do, you you do your research as well. <laughs> but now that I'm married, I have I have stuff. You can't, you can't you can't marry a woman and not suddenly accumulate Bed things. Bath and Beyond. And I'm not even saying this in a bad way. It's just that you know, pe- most well, people have stuff. Well, when you create a home, yes, it it needs stuff. Exactly. And now we have uh, so much stuff. It's ridiculous. I can't even recognize my own home anymore. But that's it, it's all beautiful. I'm saying that with her right here. Uh, so I want to ask you things that no one's ever asked you, but I've looked at all your interviews. Everyone's asked you everything. But there's plenty of stuff we could talk about, Larry David and Curb Your Enthusiasm. But I want to ask you about stand-up. Like you did it for, for so long. You have yeah. so much great in your book about bullshit wisdom about love, life, and comedy. I was so intrigued by the comedy advice. And you're so funny on the show. Obviously, every time you you open your mouth on the show, everyone's laughing. What got you into comedy? Uh, Stand-up, you know, is a thing unto itself. I mean, it's not like anything else. Uh, and I'm sitting in this room. This Where we are right now, which is upstairs at Stand-Up New York on West 78th Street, this used to be West 78th Street Theater Lab. This was in the mid-'80s. It was run by uh, these two acting teachers. I forgot their name. One of them had a big beard. He used to live here. Do you know any of this history? No. Okay. Uh, they were both acting teachers, and they had this West, 38, uh, West 78th Street Theater Lab, and it was this room. And Saturday nights, there were shows here. And I remember probably this, – this is what sta- how stand-up fucks with your head. I'm allowed to use language, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is that You're I encouraged. remember, here we are. Now, what is this, 36 years later? 1983, 1984, I remember doing a show here and dying. The minute I walked into this room, that's the first thing that I remembered. So those things stay with you so deeply. When you die on stage, it is so deep in your bones that I still now, 35 years later, remember that walking into this room. I think people don't realize that. They think... Um, and they always give advice like, oh, take the good with the bad. Like, don't, you have to treat one like the other with equanimity. But when you, when you bomb or die, like, it's like, it's like the audience is rejecting you personally. Your, your, your <laughs> inner being, your soul, your everything that you are is being completely rejected. Yeah. And so even now, like you've been doing it for. And believe me, I, I've killed way more than I've died. Way more, but walking into this room, I remembered that day. That's. 35 know, years later. I was going to say that's funny, but it's also sad, of course. Well, it's, it's <laughs> a statement on, on how, uh, uh, how, what stand-up is like. I mean, how it, you, you, you get up on stage, and if you're good, you bear your soul. You know, I'm looking at these uh, pictures here. You have album covers on the wall here. And Richard Pryor was, to me, the first person I ever saw as a stand-up who just went on stage and just opened, ripped his guts open and his heart and just let it all out there. And that was so inspiring to me as a comedian to see him do what he did. Cause that's, to me, that was always my goal is to just open myself in a way that left me completely vulnerable to them rejecting me. But luckily more often than not, they didn't. <laughs> yeah. You have this great quote and I'm going to try to remember it. And if I can't remember it, I'll just look it up right in my notes here. But you have this great quote where you started to really, I mean, you, you were getting good, but then you noticed a real evolution when instead of wanting the audience to love you, you 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 wanted the audience to Hear me, need probably. you to love them, or uh, oh okay yeah yeah I, I, you know I, I, I think I think what happens uh, I think that people focus on being funny, and the audience doesn't so much want to laugh. That's not their goal. They want to be taken care of. You know, and when you see a bad comic get on stage and you get that feeling up your spine, that discomfort when a bad comic's up there, it's because they're breaking the contract. The contract is, I'm the performer, you're mine for the next 15 minutes to an hour and, and a half, whatever I'm doing, and I'm going to take care of you. And when when you're not doing your job, the audience has to take care of the comic, and mm. that's breaking the contract, and it makes them really uncomfortable because they're there to relax, they're there to come and have a drink and and enjoy and relax and laugh. And that's my job is to facilitate that. But I, I've so I've watched your your stand up now and um uh and you've done an, an HBO half hour, right? You did an HBO yeah. half hour. And uh of course there's YouTube clips of you doing stand up and you 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 said in the book you were doing up to four hundred shows a year and sometimes yeah. six times a night and two times on the weekdays and it's it was it's an intense schedule. You've you've done it quite a bit. Yeah. And um, 
what do you think are some other than humor, which is of course is a great way to take care of the audience. What are some other ways that you found yourself taking care of those? You're very funny in the stand up. You're, you're obviously going for the laughs. The audience wants you to hear them. It, it, it's an odd thing. You know, I mean, I always work the, I don't do stand up that much anymore, but I, I, I always worked the audience. You know, that was always my thing is that I worked them because it was more interesting to me. I mean, I always had my material and my jokes and stuff to fall back on, but you have to read an audience and they want you to hear them. Not literally. It's not, and you know, young comics would always ask me for advice and I would say, you need to connect. And I didn't mean literally connect to an audience. I literally connected, but that's not what I mean. It, was, it meant hearing them, hearing what they need. And you're, when you're on stage, you have a sixth sense that you know what they need. So what do you think, what do you think, um, like how would you, how would you go about determining what they need? Like just, and you, and you mentioned how each audience is almost like they form together to form their own unique personality. Each they do. One. And so how do you kind of, other than experience and intuition, which that's I know is the all answer. It is. You smell it. You smell it. it it's, uh, I mean, maybe that's where the talent is in a way, is being able to, to be sensitive enough to know, to feel them. Like I always kind of felt as though as a comedian, I was an energy mover, you know? So I would feel the the energy of the audience and I would have to take it into my body and really, really quickly work it through and know what, what they needed to, to give out. So I would have to move the energy in the room. Sometimes there'd be a really negative vibe in the room and you don't know why. Maybe it's one person. You know, I would call it the president of the audience sometimes. It would be like one person mm. who would be in there giving off a bad vibe. And you have to quickly take their energy and spin it around and make it my own. And now it's my show and you're in my energy. And how do you think, like, can you think of a specific example? Uh, and, and by the way, I think this is all related to your your career and acting and curb your enthusiasm and so on. But can you think of a specific example where you took this negative energy and spun it around? And No, because <laughs> when I'm on stage, I'm completely in a zone that I have no awareness. I, I don't remember anything. I, I literally, I would say 98% of the time go into a zone. Huh. And... Um, not in the beginning. I mean, that comes with experience and, you know, just having the file in your head that you could go to and your techniques. A lot of it is technique that you don't even know you have that's ingrained. So muscle memory in your brain and your body. Um, but I, I, just, I just know that feeling of shifting. It's my job to shift the energy in the room, to make it mine so that they're hearing me and I'm hearing them. And we're all in this experience together. This is why I love live stand-up. It's not like a stand-up on TV. We're all in this experience together right now. And this is never going to happen again. What we're all experiencing as, as, a, as the uh, collective unconscious of this moment is never going to happen again. And it's, it's like sex in that way. We're having this experience now, and this is peak experience, and then it's over, and it's gone. That's why I don't like taping. I would never look at tapes of myself. <laughs> On uh, doing stand-up. Doing right? stand-up. Yeah, you're supposed to look at your tapes and learn from yeah. it. And it was like, it was always painful to me to look at tapes of myself because I felt like that was, it's over. Next. Yeah, it's interesting because so many people give the advice to look at, to, yeah. to study, you know, your mistakes or when they're not laughing and how to cut out words. And, to me, and so it was on. always intuitive. It was always in my body that I would know. But you would have written material to fall back oh, on, yeah, like you always, said. Oh, yeah, always, always. But you do do a lot of crowd work. Yeah. And, uh, um, but, you know, again, it, so so one thing there is, I find when I'm watching, like, let's say a Netflix special, I get bored. Some guy's on the right. stage or some woman's on the stage right. and they're staying comedy for an hour. But if you're in a club whether you're on the stage or in the audience, like I know when the, the meager time I'm on the stage, I try to make it an experience rather than me projecting jokes to the audience. Correct. You want them to have an experience so they don't have to be at home watching YouTube. You That's want them right. to feel good it's about a complete, coming out. It's a live experience. It's why live theater is still alive and exciting and it's why stand-up is still thriving because there's no experience like the live experience. It's, not, <laughs> it's completely different watching a Netflix special. And I don't like doing those specials as a performer because I feel like I have to, it's not what I do. You know, it's, it's, that's all about material. It's not about the, uh, interaction with the audience. Well, well, and you, you mentioned how you kind of sense the energy in the room and what kind of personality it is and how to transform that energy. I imagine this, a sim those skills must translate over to when you're doing, you know, essentially for, for those who don't know, curb your enthusiasm, you could describe this is largely improv and people, there's no script. There's like an outline that Larry right. David does. It's seven pages instead of the typical 22 pages of right. word by word. And then, you know, maybe 
the rough outline points, and then you go in there and improv. But but uh, just because I people have a, the wrong impression of how we improvise, it's not some free fall for all improv. I mean, Larry, Larry's genius. I've always said he's got so many geniuses, but his main thing I think is story. He's brilliant at story. So he lays out the story, and we know exactly what we have to do in each scene. The dialogue's not written, but we know exactly the points we have to make, where we have to get to, why we're doing the scene, what our relationship are with each other. Everything's right there except the dialogue. So the dialogue for me almost writes itself for all of us, you know. So, so like for instance, in the but, scene. But, but the important thing about, about uh, improv is listening. I mean, if you're not listening in improv, it's the same thing what I'm talking about with stand up. It's all listening, it's just a different level of it. In improv, if you're not listening, you're not in the scene. If you're in the scene and, and, you know, Larry says something to me and I hear him and I respond, I don't have preconceived notions in my head of what I'm going to say back to him. So it's, what what happens? Like he's talking and then you just start. Well, sometimes, he, uh, yeah, well, he'll say, um, well, we'll be there and we'll say, okay, this is what we have to get to in this scene. I, I don't know. Give me an example of a scene. I can't. Okay, good. Because uh, we talked about this with Jeff, the scene where um, he's with Catherine O'Hara. She's playing someone who's. Oh, okay, Funk know, House's crazy sister. Yeah. Bam, bam. Um, he has sex with her and then scene, the then scene, they're at the dinner. dinner table at my, yeah. at my house. So we know at some point somebody is going to, Accuse uh, Bam Bam is going to say something about having sex with Jeff, and I'm going to respond. So, you know, probably the director or Larry, somebody said to Catherine O'Hara, okay, you start the scene. You know, he'll, Larry usually says to me, you start the scene, you know. And and then we just go from there. And then you just, I'm listening for what's happening. And But I'm in the scene. It's my house. It's my dinner party. I have other guests. I'm schmoozing with them. And then, you know, through the corner of my eye, my ear, I hear her mention she had sex with my husband. You know, and then I respond. Right. So I could almost, do you ever try to think like, well, how can I respond in a way that's a surprise to the audience? Because the obvious would be, thing would be to be like, what? What did you just say? Like, do you ever try to think, how can I no. be unobvious? No. One of the reasons why Larry, this season I think it was different, but one of the, and I always got the uh, outlines as did Jeff, because Jeff was one of the EPs. But one of the things that Larry always did was not give the guest stars or the, the cast the outline because he didn't want them planning anything ahead of time. He didn't want them lying in bed the night before thinking of jokes. Then it's a bad sitcom. Right. You know, then it's just jokey and it, it, it doesn't work. You know, what, what he wanted everybody to just authentically be in the scene and respond as though you would. Is, it's make-believe, you know. Okay, pretend I'm Susie Green. I put on those outfits. I become her. You know, so now I'm playing. I'm pretending it's make-believe. I'm making believe I'm Susie Green and I'm talking to these people. And so, and so, in that particular scene, for instance, I guess there must also be safety in, in numbers and the fact that you know that, okay, if this take is not as funny or is not exactly what Larry wants, you're going to do it again anyway. Right. And usually when we do more takes, a lot of times it's for camera because we need a lot of takes for camera because they need a lot of uh, choices in editing because it's improvised. When you have a script, you know a page a minute pretty much, and you know this is going to be... But we'll do a scene sometimes, it'll be... 10 minutes, and it's got to be cut down to two. So they need a lot of coverage for editing. Um, I had another point I was going to make. Oh, this Benadryl is kicking in uh, about the improv. Oh, a, a lot of takes. And, and then a, a lot of times we'll do takes and we leave information out. And then we'll stop and say, like, okay, we have to get this information in. Because it's all about pushing the story forward. I see. So so he gives you the outline and it has the, you, you know exactly so you're saying he's an expert at story, and it's, and the stories are these sometimes these obscure little things. Like I'm just even thinking of the very first episode of season one. It's just the pant fold, right? <laughs> like just some right. stupid. But that's going to be a callback. I mean, everything has a reason. If something like that comes out up, ninety percent of the time you're going to hear it again. It's going to have a callback. Well, what always impresses me with all of these things is that everybody in the episode is involved. Like everybody right. has a storyline, and they all come to a point at the exact same time. Like in that episode, episode one, but I could think of it in every episode, you're all, you, it, you all end up at dinner at the same right. place and it's the cringe comedy thing where like, oh, everybody's looking at each other and it's horrible. Well, one of the things that we always talk about with my relationship with Larry is that, you know, we have this volatile relationship where I'm always yelling and screaming at him and kicking him out of the house. And then the next day I'll be like, hey, Lai, you want to come to the dinner party? You know, it's like, we, I forget, we're like siblings. You forget everything. Yeah. And 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 I, I think this, it, it struck me more this season than ever because of Bob Einstein's death. 
and that he wasn't there this season, how close-knit of an on-screen family we are. And we're just this little world that's, that Larry's created, and it's me and Jeff and Cheryl and Ted Danson and Richard Lewis and J.B. Smoove, uh, Leon. And, you know, Bobby was such a huge part of that. In his absence, it really felt like a death in the family, in in our TV family. You know, it always, I, I want to get back to the stand-up in a second, but it always strikes me with Curb Your Enthusiasm, and, and this is maybe true also for Seinfeld, I, it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems that Larry David's underappreciated as a manager of people because he must do something to keep not only all the actors and staff and HBO and so on motivated, but he also keeps you all creatively fulfilled. You're all having storylines that fulfill you creatively. Like, I suppose many sitcoms where some people are just left to the yeah, side and forgotten yeah. about for episodes and episodes. You, Susie Essman is never, yeah. you know, Susie Green is never forgotten in yeah. any episode. Well, you know, the question I get asked, I would say more than any other question about Curb is, is Larry really like his character? And my response is always, how could he be like his, that jerky character and and be a boss? You know, he's the leader. He's our leader. He's the one who, the crew loves him. Um, you know, I, I don't know about the Seinfeld years, but I can't imagine it was any different. He's the person that we all look to. He's He's our, he's our leader and he knows how to create the world for all of us, and including the crew. Crew's a huge part of the show. And so how do you think, like, what are these, what are the and, management and, and if techniques he was, of- If he was that jerky, it, w- it wouldn't be that way. Yeah, like I, his character. I, I it, that must be the case, because again, you're nine, 19 years into Curb Your Enthusiasm. Right. Seinfeld was the biggest hit ever. And by the way, most of the crew, a good portion of the crew drops whatever they're doing because we come back at weird schedules. You know, we don't have a regular, it's not like a network where every fall we start again. And mo- a lot of the crew drop whatever they're doing and come back to do Curb. Yeah, like that's I, how much they respect Larry. You mentioned in, in this book how after the end of every season, um, he says, okay, that's it. We're not doing any more. And yeah. now it's five seasons later. Yeah. So obviously, and I remember. Uh, Five years ago, I had Carol Leeper on the yeah, uh, podcast. I had lunch and, with her yesterday. <laughs> and she she said, oh, we're not doing any more. And that was, of course, five years ago. There's been two seasons since then. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Larry uh, does what Larry wants. Luckily, he keeps on wanting to do more. So I'm happy about that. And and what do you think are, like, if you were to say the management techniques of, of Larry David, what would be number one and number two? He treats everybody really respectfully. Mm. You know, he's very respectful. He's very clear. And when you work for Larry, I mean, I've worked for so many people that it's vague and you're not sure what they want and you feel insecure. You're giving them what they, Larry's very clear. He has a very clear comedic vision. And so it's just easy to work for him because he knows clearly what he wants. So it's easy to give that to him. And it seems like your comedic vision from your standup is, is the way you describe it is similar to his and that you, you know, you, you mentioned in the book, um, I'm trying to remember the quote, but comedians walk into a room and try to figure out what's, what's, I don't know the exact quote, what's off, what's, what's wrong. Yeah. And I, th- I think I've heard Larry say something similar or Seinfeld say something similar. And he's definitely just looking at the weird or absurd and everything, you know, even if I, it's very tiny. I think that comedians, we're the social commentators of the world, you know, from way back when we were the court jester who was saying what everybody was thinking but couldn't say. And I think that, that that's our job in society is to, I don't want to sound pretentious in this. So I I think if this has been my experience being a comedian and having so many close friends who are comics. I think we see a little bit more than other people see. And we notice more than other people notice. That's that's our, you know, our antenna is up in that way. And then we process it through this comedic prism that we have as a gift or a, a, a skill or however we've processed it. And then we spit it out into the world and it's skewed. It's a little twisted. So people see it. And they say, oh, my God, I never, that's exactly correct. I never thought of that. But it's, but it's resonating with them. Right. One of the reasons, I mean, Larry, what Larry does in his character, and one of the reasons why he's beloved is he says what everybody's thinking, but they can't say. He has no tact. Right, like he, sa- he says about his character is that 
the character he plays is who he wishes he was. Yeah, he aspires to be that <laughs> right. character is what he tells me. Right. He aspires to be that guy who you run into a, an old friend on the street and they say, let's have lunch. Who's going to say, you know what? We're never really going to have lunch. I don't really want to have lunch. Instead of going through, oh, sure, email me and call and, and then trying to get it. You know, he's, he aspires to be that truth teller. He's a truth teller. And I think that's what comedians are. We're truth tellers and we see the world and we spit it back out in a, in a twisted comedic way that makes it more acceptable. When people are laughing, there's an openness there that they can accept things that they can't otherwise accept. Well, so so let me apply that in the context of, of Curb. What I think is great, I think one of the things that makes Curb such a hit, other than everything else about Curb that makes it such a hit, is the fact that the laughter among the you and the other actors is so organic. You're laughing because it's a real laugh. It's not yeah. like a scripted laugh. Right. It's all very real. And you real. can tell. People yeah. can tell. Even if they don't say to themselves, huh, that sounds different than a laugh on the Big Bang Theory. This is a real right. laugh. Nothing against the Big Bang Theory, but that, this is like Jeff and Larry are having a fun time. Jeff and yeah. Richard Lewis, are, is that, are they joking around with each other? They really are. We laugh a lot on set. We laugh a lot on set. So That's why like I think Larry job. keeps doing it. Larry doesn't need the money. He doesn't need the accolades, you know. I think he does it because he has a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. My character rarely laughs. <laughs> But that's my character. But I imagine you, I imagine the process makes you laugh because you're just screaming the most outlandish things at Jeff and Larry like all the time. Right. And you at between takes, I imagine you must be just cracking up. It must, is it the funnest job in the world? It's the funnest job in the world. First of all, I don't have to memorize lines, which is amazing. You know, I hate memorizing lines. It always causes me anxiety. And I, this is my job. I show up, I tell everybody to go fuck themselves, then they give me money, and I go home. And they love me for it. So I couldn't even have imagined this job. You know, this, this to me is the greatest job in the world. Now, you you mentioned when, when Larry first told you to call Jeff a fat fuck, you were a little nervous because you didn't want to, like, Jeff. Well, in my comedy, in my stand-up, I never like to make fun of what people look like because... Mm -hmm. You know, unless they're dressed ridiculously or something, it was a choice. Because it's to me, that's low. Yeah. You know, and you know, Jeff always had a weight problem. It's, it's, he writes about it in curbing yeah. it. That's the half of the book is his his diet in between takes of curb your enthusiasm. Yeah, and and he, you know, so this this was nineteen years ago, season one, and uh, it, it, Larry pulls me over in that scene uh, with the with the fresh air front the wire the wire I think is the name of the episode where the fresh air front kid steals us blind. Jeff lets the kid into the house and the kid robs us. And I just, and the only, that was the first real Susie Green scene. And the only direction I got from Larry was, I want you to rip Jeff a new asshole. And I thought, well, I've been in relationships before. I could do that. And uh, I'm yelling at him and screaming and Larry, you know, pulls me over. And Larry Charles directed that episode. It's the first time I met Larry Charles. And both of them uh, pull me over and they're like, D go further, go further. And I'm going for it. I'm going for it. And then finally, Larry pulls me over. He says, make fun of Jeff's fat. I was like, Larry, I don't want to do that. It's not my style. I think that's just mean, and it's just gratuitous. He's like, go ahead. He knows you're kidding. And that was the first time I called him a fat fuck, and it was like the genie was let out of the bottle, and that was it. <laughs> well, that's interesting because you, so, so where and, do you and think— By the way, people ask Jeff all the time, do you get upset when Susie says that to you? And his response is, Susie Esmond is not saying that to me. It's the character saying it to me. So no, he doesn't get upset. But so, so but you said you your first reaction was that it's gratuitous, which— means maybe you felt it was a little hacky just to kind of it was know, it felt low yeah and and yet larry's co comedic sense was this is exactly the target the bullseye right. and i trusted him and, and what do you think what do you think was the discrepancy what do you think he saw before you said it that you didn't see i think it was about their relationship really mm -hmm. is what it was about it was about the husband and wife relationship and that she would be so frustrated with him you know in that in his weight issues and his constantly uh, constant dieting and his and his risking her livelihood by his un unhealthy behavior you know of being fat i mean she's afraid he's going to drop dead yeah you know you have to put acting stakes into it and she's I, correct me if i'm wrong but i've seen the whole series like three times she's never really aware that he's cheating on her <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Or if she that's turns true. like a blind eye towards it. She turns a blind eye towards it just to get what she wants. She doesn't want to sleep with him. Let him go fuck somebody else, and she can get her her new house. Right, right. 
Yeah, everybody's yeah. moving all through the seasons. Yeah. I guess because you can't hold a house from if you don't know where the next season's going to be. Well, but also just some of it is just pure logistics. Uh -huh. I mean, I remember one season, maybe it was season three. I think it was season three where I think it was Mary, Joseph, and Larry, that that episode, where I'm throwing Jeff's clothes out the window and screaming and yelling at him. And then the neighbors complained because I was cursing this kid, little kids around so they wouldn't let us rent the house again. So That's we had funny. to then move again. And another time was he wanted us to move so I, we could do the house tour bit. You know, there were so many like logistic things. So, so, you know, it's interesting because obviously Larry David is playing Larry David, the creator of Seinfeld. Right. And I, I say he's playing because, as you mentioned, it's not exactly Larry It's not David. anything like right. him. And and Jeff's playing an agent, but he right. doesn't really seem like like the Ari Gold from Entourage style right. of agent. Right. He's just like hanging out with Larry exactly. all the time. And I wonder how much of it, like, like for instance, when Larry David flies to New York, he's flying c commercial. Uh, my my guess is no. He flies commercial. Oh really? Yeah. What? That's interesting. So I'm trying to ask you something that's never been asked before. Larry David flies commercial. He does fly commercial. Why? Why is that? Uh, I I think that it's just a choice. You know, I, I might be environmental. The amount of fuel you use in a private jet is ridiculous. Yeah, might be. That's true. I'm not sure. Uh, so so okay. Back to to stand up. You were doing stand up. He has flown private. Mm -hmm. Because right, I flew just... with him once, but but he generally flies commercial. Do you ever see uh, aspects of his behavior that's like, oh, okay, this is the guy who made Seinfeld, and it's enormous. The difference between his life and my life is enormous. You know, interestingly, because I've known Larry since 1985, 86, when he lived in a studio apartment in Manhattan Plaza on West 43rd Street. Yeah, where, where he was across from the Kramer. The Kramer, from the real Kramer. Um and, you know, he had no money. Then. If I would have, if at the bar at Catch a Rising Star, if I would have said to all the comedians, Larry David is going to be richer and more famous and more successful than all of us put together, everybody would have laughed at me and, and thought it was ridiculous. Because he wasn't that kind of a, uh, he wasn't that, he didn't, he didn't have that kind of an ambition. You know, he his, his ambition wasn't to be rich and famous and, and you know, successful. That wasn't who he was. He was always just, you know, this creative, this, this, comedic genius. We used to all go into the room and watch him when he was doing stand-up because he was so brilliant. And the audience would just stare at him like having no idea what he was talking about. And in his, in his stand-up, it doesn't seem like he mined his life so much as just come up with these obscure kind of almost references. Not true. Okay, tell Not me. Not true. I, I don't know why, but stuff happens to Larry that doesn't happen to anybody else. And I know that so many of the things, like I, when I think about Larry back in those days, I think about standing at the bar, Catch a Rising Star, and him just telling me all his tales of woe about dating, which all of that became George storylines. Right, but in his stand-up, did you see that? Did you hear that in his stand-up? Yes, he used to do a lot of that stuff in his stand-up. And then I, I know that Jason... Uh, Alexander, who played George, would they, he'd get a script and he would say, oh, this never had, this is too ridiculous. This could never have happened to anybody. And Larry would be like, it happened to me. You know, and like weird things always happen to Larry for some reason. And I wonder, do weird things happen to Larry or is it that Larry's mind sees them in a certain way and is able to translate that into a, into comedy gold? I, I bet you, not, not to suggest that I know anything, but I bet you it's that because one time, um, Fred Stoller came on the podcast, and he wrote for Seinfeld for a year. Yeah, and he, you know, he said Larry was very always interested in real stories. So he would basically right. fire the fi uh, writing staff each year to bring it, or, or most of them, just to bring in new right. writers with new stories, so he could always mine real stories. Nothing was fake. Right. Even if it wasn't coming from Larry's life, it was coming from someone's. That life. That I don't know about, but that sounds that sounds very plausible. But but like when I think of his stand up, I think of like one joke, for instance. Um, What's the deal with Hitler and magicians? And he goes into this whole skit. He'll do he'll do weird, you know, setups and concepts. But then he would have some stuff that was very uh, particular to him. Can you remember something? Or uh, I know it's a long time ago. Uh, I, no, I can't. <laughs> and now you would would mind your life very very much yeah, so in, yeah. in your stand up. That was I remember in, in in your book you comment how you were watching Joy Behar do stand up, and I don't think many people even realize she. She was a major stand-up comedian before yeah. The View or what, the, the show she's on. And you said what was appealing to her for you 
was that she was, oh, she's the same on stage as she is right. off the stage. And and you kind of aspired for that. And, and then you got Which I was there. able to get to, but it didn't come naturally to me in the beginning. It, it's really funny because, you know, I'm so known for working an audience. In the very beginning, I didn't even speak in my own voice. I just did characters. Because you your know? background was improv initially, right? Yeah. And I would just do these characters, whoever, you know, was in my life. Um, and I was scared to death to even speak in my own voice, except for little intros and outros. Um, and yeah, Joy was, you know, Joy's my best friend, but she was she was an inspiration to me in that way of, she was the same. She was, she was like just sitting around, you know, the kitchen table with her girlfriends, which I was always funny sitting around the kitchen table with my girlfriends. I didn't know how to translate that. You know, this, this idea of just being yourself, uh, quote unquote, is not so easy. Yeah, no, and and I think I think by itself, it doesn't make any sense because you're yourself. That means different things in different contexts. Correct. So, you so know, you're a mother, you're a sister, you're a daughter, you're a uh, all of those things, and and each relationship is different. But you're right. When I see um, YouTube clips of of Joy doing stand up, it is as if she's talking to other women her age. Like, right. this is why we like Clinton. Right. Because we, he likes women like this. Right, right ladies? Right. And uh, right. uh, it's not like she's talking to her kids. It's like she's talking to her girlfriends. Right, to her girlfriends. And, and I kind of learned that from her of just go out and pretend I'm around the kitchen table with my girlfriends, just making them laugh. And that was, you know, incredibly uh, revelatory to me. I think, I think that is what made, just what, again, from what I watched of you, that's what made you so appealing makes you so appealing to the audience is that you're just having fun with them in this very comfortable way. Like often the audience gets anxious. Is the comedian going to make fun of me? But you're like, you'll right. point to a guy, oh, you look familiar. Did I have sex with you? Yeah. <laughs> Which sort of makes fun of you a little bit because like as you get older, you forget things and, yeah. you know, you have lots of relationships or not or whatever. And You don't want to use, when you work the audience, the mistake people make is using the audience to get to their punchline. Uh -huh. You don't want to use them. You want mm. to include them. You want it to be inclusive. But, you know, I used to, you know, I used to do stand-up you know, every night, several times a night. You're not always in the mood, you know. So my whole, my mantra to myself before I would go on stage would always be, I love these people. I love these people. I love, that's what I, the head that I would get into, that I loved them. And that I wanted, more than I wanted to make them laugh, I wanted to communicate something to them. Mm. That's a, It's like um, uh, Will Smith just did this show on Facebook where he's hitting his bucket list things and, and one of them was doing stand-up. So, of course, who does he go to? He asked Dave Chappelle for advice for doing his first few minutes of stand-up. And Dave Chappelle says something interesting. It was more important to be interesting than funny. I agree with that. I agree with that. And you see, like I see down here, a lot of, and you mentioned it in the book, a lot of people are able to craft their 15 minutes or five minutes in such a way as to make sure the audience is going to laugh. But then after they're done, you don't necessarily remember anything You don't remember. Said. Yeah, exactly. So they're safe to book, but they're not necessarily going to break out right. career-wise. They've somehow hit, hit a lower level than the peak. And you know, the thing... You know, there was there, there was a comedian, Ronnie Shakes, back in the 80s. He died young. He had a heart attack and died young. He was a great comic. He did Carson a lot. And and um, I remember him saying, maybe he said it to Joy. I don't know if he said it to me or to Joy. Something about it, it takes you at least, you know, eight to ten years to find your voice as a stand-up comic. Oh, he said five years. It takes you five years to find your voice as a stand-up comic, to find who you are as a comic. And I remember thinking, oh, it's not going to take me that long. It took me 20 years, you know. It takes so long to figure out who you are on stage. And that's why stand-up, you know, that's why it's still intriguing to so many people because you never really get it. it you know, I almost see this trend now in, like, business self-help that, you know, they encourage, C you know, get out of your comfort zone. CEOs should do an open mic you know, it's not a bad thing for anybody to do. It's, it's not a bad thing, but it's not the same as 20 years or 10 years or five years of, of going on stage two, three, 10 times a and week. And the technique you develop. It's just, you know, so, yeah. So so your your first time on Carson was, was 1989. So that was six years after you start. Was that, did you think this was going to be, okay, I'm going on Johnny Carson. This is going to be it. it was, I've never been so scared in my life. It was the most frightening thing I've ever experienced. So you're sta you 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 know. I remember I, there was no moisture in my mouth whatsoever. I was completely like, <gasps> I was so scared. So so like the second before you go out, what were you thinking? 
I don't remember. It was a long time were you ago. Say, were you saying, I'm going to love the audience? I, I, I just, I, I don't remember. I think I was just paralyzed with fear. And, paralyzed with fear. Um, did he call you over to the... Oh, no, I only did panel because I, was uh-huh. on a, I, I wasn't doing stand-up. I was okay. on a series at that time called Baby Boom. And that was an NBC show. So they had me on. It, it was a very, if I recall, it was an awkward interaction because he didn't know I was a comic. He thought I was just this new little, you know, uh, ingenue on an NBC series. And I did some uh, risque, bluish kind of stuff, and he was a little bit thrown. I re- it's so long ago. I, I wiped it out of my mind. It was not one of my favorite experiences. And by the way, what really blew my mind, because, you know, I grew up with Carson. It yeah. wasn't like it is now. I mean, that was it. It was Carson. Um, was looking in his eyes, and it was just cold. Really? Oh, man. It was just steel, ice cold. And that really threw me. And David Steinberg was on before me. You know, at that time, he was, you know, a huge comedian. He's now one of my closest friends, which is so odd. And so, he was the one, so they quote he, him, yeah, yeah, he's a very good friend of mine. And he was the one that kind of held my hand when I was sitting. I didn't know him. That was the first time I met him. But I remember he was very comforting because I, I, did, I just got ice from Johnny. Ice in the sense that you think there, there, there wasn't the real emotional infrastructure inside to I don't connect. know. I it, don't know. And that be, he made him maybe in a weird way such a good connector to anybody? I don't. It was the first time I ever met him, and it was all kind of surreal. Mm-hmm. So I don't remember that much, but I just remember that, you know, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So then fast forward 10 years later, you're still, I say still in a negative way, but I don't mean it that way. You, you're you're doing stand-up all the time. You're appearing well, You on- could say still, because <laughs> in those years, it, through the through the 90s, you know, I had been then doing it for a long time, and I had, had a couple. I had a, two HBO specials, and then, you know, a lot of success in certain ways. But I hadn't broken through. And I remember, you know, I would come here downstairs at this very club. I lived across the street, and um, so this was always my last stop of the night. You know, because uh, I would come here, do my set, and then go home. But I remember I, I would just be feeling like I don't know how much better I have to be. I was killing all over the place. I had become such a good comic, so strong, and nothing was happening for me in terms of breaking into the next level or making money. I wasn't making enough money. You know, it was driving me crazy. So there's, there's really three things there. There's there's the making enough money, which we need to do to, to live and survive. Yeah. And there's, there's skill level, which you felt, you know, had been constantly improving, but now you were really, as you said, killing it. And then there's success, which is you get to that point in career where, like like you say now, it's the funnest job in the world is right. being on the side of Curb Your Enthusiasm, which even if it wasn't, I'm sure it's financially does well for you, but even if it wasn't as much, you, that you would count Well, it that wasn't a for a long time. I mean, now I do really well with Curb, but I, I, yeah, first few years I made day scale. Right, you, they, he money. called you up and just said, hey, we can't pay yeah, you, I didn't have any, I didn't have any, make any money for the first five seasons. You know, actually, that, that, that someone was, you know, I was watching rewatching some some episodes last night and um my son asked me um you know if Larry David cuz we were talking about I was explaining and pausing and explaining different things just to kind of help me understand but we were talking about the budget and I said how it was a very low budget you, you were, it, you were it being was paid very scale. low budget and he asked an interesting question to me which is well if he made so much money creating sci-fi why wouldn't he just fund it cuz it I, doesn't work that way well well, well and, I, and I said He's he I my answer was incorrect, which is he's probably not stupid like me, which is I would probably pull it out of my pocket to pay for it. But what was his approach? I mean, it that that they were two completely different things. That was his money. It wasn't like he was financing, you know, an independent film or something like that. We had a budget from HBO and we worked within the budget. That's that's just what it was. It was he, no He can't call up HBO or he wouldn't call up HBO and say, Listen, I need another million to do this episode. I mean, maybe now he would, but we were really under the radar for the first few seasons. You know, nobody knew. I would say I I could just judge it anecdotally by when people started stopping me in the street. That wasn't until after season three. I would have stopped you season one. I was a fan (laughs) from the beginning. And I would tell so many people to watch, and they're like, I don't get it. Yeah. And then I would explain, that's the guy who wrote Seinfeld. And they're like, oh, okay, I'll give it another try. Because it, it wasn't clear immediately. Right, right. So, so we, but but we, were, we were not a success. Luckily, we were on HBO, 
And we were like a critical hit. So they just, and we were low budget. What was it to them to, you know, give us a million bucks an episode? Or it wasn't even that much. It was maybe 800,000 an episode. I don't know what it was. And you had, and I remember the time, I guess. Which by the way, it sounds like a lot to people hearing it, but it's not because you, you have an entire, you have a crew of 150 people. Yeah, no, I'm sure the average sitcom now is like three to five million. An Something episode. like that. So, and, but uh, I remember at the time, I think it was Chris Albrecht was the CEO. Yeah. Uh, and, and they were friends from way back. Yeah. So, because then Chris, people don't realize Chris Albrecht, who I guess now is the CEO of Stars, he was a stand up comedian at one point or, or the booker at some place in the, uh, the, the improv. improv. Yeah. yeah. Which was Larry's home club. It wasn't my club. My home in club. In LA? Was, no, here. Oh, here. We here. all lived here. Uh huh. So, so, but that, that brings to an interesting point too, which is that, it seems like, at least in prior generations, comedians grew up as a crew, and and I'm and I haven't yeah. left the you've been doing it 16 years in 1999 when right. Larry gives you the call. But comedians grew up as a crew, like you, Chris Rock. I think you mentioned Colin Quinn, John Stewart, John Stewart, Joy. Uh, so many of us, uh, you know, it w- those days in the mid 80s. At Lou DiMaggio, who called me just before I walked up the stairs here, um, he was another one of us. There were so many of us that we were a family. I mean, we were very, it was community. You'd walk into a comedy club, it was cheers. You knew all the waitresses, all the bartenders, all the comedians hanging out. You didn't have to have a social life. That was your social life. Every night we were all out working. And you were stimulated from them because obviously if you're hanging out with Jon Stewart at the bar... (laughs) The yeah, and then, you know, at the end discussed. of the night, at 2 o'clock in the morning, we'd go to the diner, and we'd go over, you know, this worked, I tried this joke, it didn't work, how was it, you know, it was, it was, it was competitive in the sense that we were all competing for stage time, but it was, there was tremendous camaraderie. I and, miss that. I and, mean, I miss those days. And, and you mentioned how the prior generation was, like, Jerry Seinfeld, Larry David, Richard Belzer, yeah. so, the generation before, Robin Williams, uh, Richard Pryor, David right. Letterman, Jay Leno, uh, so, so... It is an interesting thing. It's a subculture where everybody's like so, you know, these became the most successful people in the world. You're, right. you're you know, like you say, you're recognized on the street and you're on this hit show. Um, what do you think makes the difference between the people who break out? Again, because there's a difference between performance where you're killing it all the time and success where you, where you break out into success because some people might have a high skill but never succeed. But what do you think separates out the people who ultimately succeed? You know, uh, John Stewart once said to me, cream always rises. You know, we were talking about this. And yes, but I know some really talented people that have not broken through. Um, did they self-sabotage? Some of them did. You know, I mean, I, I think that there's that there's a certain, you have to have a, 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 a certain personality to make it in showbiz, but specifically in stand-up comedy as a comedian. And not everybody has it. Not everybody. There were people I started out with that were incredibly funny that just stopped because they couldn't handle it. It's a hard life. And there's tremendous amount of rejection and this tremendous, you know, amount of self-starting. Like what's your lowest point in terms of rejection, you know, whether it was a sitcom or on the stage or film or whatever, where you thought like, oh, I got, I'm going to become an accountant. I never, I never had that point. Huh. I never had the point where I thought I was going to do anything else. Except there were certain times when I thought, oh, maybe I'll write a screenplay and that, you know, things like that. But they were always within that world. But it's like talent, tenacity, and luck. It, it, that's what I think is the, the three things. And there's a lot of people with talent that don't have the tenacity. And there's a lot of people that have talent and tenacity that just didn't get that lucky break. Don't you think luck, though, is, yes. is a numbers game? So if you're in there for 16 years every Correct. night. Which is, brings me back to what, what we were talking about before. And I tell my kids this all the time. It's all about showing up, showing up, showing up, showing up. So 1999, uh, you know, I just had been working, 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 showing up, showing up. I did a whole bunch of stuff with the Friars Club for free uh, because I had to make my bones with all those old starkers who didn't think women were funny, Alan King and Henny Youngman and, you know, all these old comedians that I grew up watching on the Ed Sullivan show who did not think women were funny. And they especially didn't think you were funny if you were even halfway attractive. You know, you had to be obese or... One time, Alan King, (laughs) I did a gig with him in Atlantic City and he was emceeing. And his intro to me was, in my day, all the funny women had something wrong with them. Martha Ray had buck teeth. Tody Fields was fat. But this broad is funny and good looking. Please welcome Susie Esper. It's like, oh, thank you. That's my intro. You know, oh, that yeah, was the you, mindset. You, of you them. mentioned you didn't know whether to be happy or insulted. It, exactly. That. <laughs> so that that was the mindset of, of these guys. So I had to make my bones with them and, and show them all that I was a really strong comic. 
which I did over and over and over again. Um, and was, again, showing up, showing up, keep on showing up and doing good work, doing good work, let people know who you are. 1999, I believe it was when they were doing a roast of Jerry Stiller. Friars Club was doing a roast of Jerry Stiller. And of course, that's George Costanza's father in Seinfeld. Correct. And uh, it was on Comedy Central. And the Friars Club put me my name in that they wanted me to be on it. And Comedy Central rejected me. They didn't want me. For what, I mean, I don't know. Too old, too female, too Jewish. I have no idea. 1999, was Doug Herzog running it? Or no, he was running I don't it? know. I don't remember. Um, and the Friars Club fought for me to be on it. And then later on, Jean-Pierre Trubeau, who was the head of the Friars Club at that time, a place I will not go into anymore, by the way. Um, it's a den of misogyny. Um, uh, it told me that they, they kind of figured, well, we'll put her on, we'll cut her out. I had laryngitis because I was so scared. I had no voice. I was taking steroids. I was like, you know, really, I mean, literally like no voice. Um, and I killed... And they kept me on. They, they didn't cut me out because roasts are really hard. They're really, really hard to do. And you have to be super prepared. And, and it's, it's the kind of thing, it's, it, it's not my nature to do the kind of work that you do in a roast, which is kind of jokey set up punch. I'm more storytelling. But I knew I had to be really prepared and I had all my jokes and I was really prepared. And I killed and Larry David saw that. And that was why he called me and gave me the part. And he remembered you from earlier. You knew yeah, each other in the 80s. Yeah, I hadn't seen him in 10 years. I was friendly with him, but I hadn't seen him in 10 years. He'd moved to L.A. to do Seinfeld. And 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 I want to ask you about the call, but you never thought while he was at Seinfeld, like, oh, here's this guy I know at Seinfeld. If I just send him a spec script, maybe I'll be a writer or, or an actor on well, Seinfeld. Well, I wasn't really a script writer. Uh -huh. I might have thought that if I was more of a script writer, but I wasn't. A lot of people that uh, that I started with became great writers and, and had major careers, uh, Lou Schneider. I mean, people like that who wrote on Raymond and so many people Judd like Apatow. that. Judd Apatow. Judd Apatow. I wasn't that kind of a writer. So that wasn't really in my mindset. So so he calls you out of the blue. Yeah. And and he says, Susie, I want you on this show. No no audition. Did you audition? No. And he had, I think he had auditioned several people for the part. And, um, and I said, well, what's the part? Said, Don't worry about it. You could do it. I said, well, send me a script. There's no script. You know, and but I—I I mean, I knew Larry, and I knew whatever he was going to do was going to be great. And, it and was, he had earned that trust in in the community too. Yeah, and and I had no contract. It was it was a no brainer. I mean, they paid me nothing. I I did day scale. I don't know what that was—a couple of hundred bucks. And so I had nothing to lose by doing it because I hadn't. If I didn't like it, I I had no obligation. And here we are, nineteen years later. Yeah, that's amazing. It's so great. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, who else? Like thinking about it now. I can't imagine any other person other than you playing, you know, Susie Green. Well, but because— Because you defined the role. We created the character. I mean, I created the character. Larry and I, interestingly, Larry and I, to this day, have never had a discussion about who this person is, what our relationship is. We've never discussed it. But, but like, I can't even think of, like, what that role— Like, it's you, you're such a great counterpart to both Larry and Jeff. Like, could you imagine— and I'm not, and, and these are all fine people, but let's say Joy in that role or or Fran Drescher in that role. Like I can't, or It would have been different. Yeah, it, it would, would have be been different. different. And maybe it would have worked in a different way. I don't know. I don't know. know. This was perfect but though. But because <laughs> it, it was a good marriage, but I, I kind of feel as though, um, you know, I, I had this idea of who she was and here's how Larry and I work. I had an idea of who she was and he saw what I was doing and he wrote towards it. And then I saw what he was writing and gave him more of, of that. So we have this dialogue of the unconscious. We never discussed it, but we, you know, when you're improvising with somebody, there has to be a tremendous amount of trust and respect. And, and it's, it's, people always think that Larry and I don't get along, which is ludicrous because he's one of my closest friends. One of the reasons we could speak to each other in that despicable way, and same thing with Jeff, is because we trust that we're not, we're playing. You know, I don't really speak to him that way in real life. So it just organically happened. And the, the whole show happened that way. I mean, I, it, Einstein is on my mind so much lately because I was very close with him and I miss him so much. And when I think about his character, I was watching something the other day somebody sent me of his character and how his character evolved over the years to become this, you know, last season, he was hilarious last season. Season, season nine. nine season nine. Mm -hmm. oh, he wasn't in season yeah. 10. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss on, yeah, on that. Thank you. Um, Big loss for all of us. And and so so the interesting thing, too, is your character of Susie Green is so different than your stand-up 
uh, yeah. character, which is like you say, is almost as loving towards the audience. And you see that in 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 the Susie Green character too. Like when you and Larry are getting along, it's almost like you're very motherly to, well, to Larry. Well, but the thing about Susie Green is she's always provoked. And frequently it has to do with her daughter, who she's amazingly protective of. Yeah. You know, I mean, he steals her her. Her doll. her doll head. <laughs> he steals her dog. He, you know, all, all these kinds of things he does to, he he tells her to shut up when she's singing. I mean, all these kinds of, so a lot of her response is this maternal, uh, you know, protective thing about her child. And, and, you know, what's interesting is that other than Jeff, I feel, most of the characters or all the characters have really good intentions in all of their actions. Like, like even Larry. Larry's always creating these faux pas and like doing things outside the the conventional rules of of etiquette but he kind of has good intentions he's being honest right and he doesn't want to harm anybody right um but he can't help himself he can't help himself and particularly he doesn't want to harm you right he just gets into trouble with you right because maybe there's a misunderstanding which is why the next day he comes to a dinner party right and then i kick him out again and he comes back and then i kick him out again <laughs> But in comedy, you know, like a, a question I get asked a lot, which is like an annoying question, is how have the characters grown and changed over the years? We haven't. That's the whole point. Just like in Seinfeld. I, exactly. Or you think of Ralph Cramden. Every week he had a new scheme. He didn't learn from his mistakes. But it's just like in life, too. People don't really change Well, in that life, much. hopefully you learn a little bit. But, hopefully, but, but in how comedy, you, do? you In comedy, it's not funny if you learn. Huh. What's funny is doing the same mistake over and over again. Well, okay, so let's let's that's interesting because so comedy there's sort of this uh disconnect between what the the comedy is a, sort of a subtraction of knowledge. So for instance, if you compare Woody Allen with Bruce Willis. So let's say both are sitting in a room and terrorists run in. Bruce Willis is going to jump over the table and start shooting everybody and and hitting them. And Woody Allen's going to like go to the corner and like, how do I they're get out of here? They're characters. Let's clarify that. They're, okay. they're, they're characters. Right, characters. We don't know who they are in but, real but, life. But, 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 but the one's image comedic. Of it. Yeah. One's a comedic character. The other is an action hero. Right. And so the comedic character has, is, ha, doesn't have the knowledge of the action hero. And so, so do you think comedy is kind of the subtraction of, of knowledge of what's supposed to be done? Or, or in some ways, like Seinfeld's more like an addition of knowledge. He's observing things. Jerry Seinfeld's observing things that nobody else is observing and pointing it out. I don't know the answer to that because any intellectualization of com of, of stand up is always like I, I don't know what people they, they talk about it's like uh, what is that 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 thing that they always say it's tragedy plus time or something I, yeah. I don't know what anybody's talking about when they talk about that to me it's just all instinct hmm. you know it's like it's when I start to analyze it I, I, I don't you know it takes away the organic quality of it what about when you're writing when you're writing a comedy how do you think about it I think about what makes me laugh. I only think about what makes me laugh. So like you think about something that happened that week or that day? Whatever. Yeah, whatever it is, laughed. if it makes me laugh. I, I don't think about, oh, the audience is going to laugh at this. I'm, if I'm not laughing at it, I'm not interested. And you're not as much premise, punchline, premise, punchline. Yeah, you're as more stories. Story. Yeah. But you find the funny inside the stories. Yeah, I mean, that's what that, you know, it, it's an interesting, I mean, like when you think about really great comedians, like it's, for some reason, Gilbert just came to mind. So Gilbert Who's Gottfried. been on the podcast. And he is the funniest. I agree funniest with your person. Sen sentiment. Funniest person in the whole world to me. I, I crack up la watching his YouTube videos. Like the, what's the one? The three name. The three I, name people. Oh yeah. my God. I've listened to that a thousand times. But the thing about Gilbert and Gilbert just touches my funny bone. Some people find him annoying and grating. To me, he's the funniest person of all. Larry also. Larry makes me laugh. But um, Gilbert has this innate ability, and I wouldn't want to analyze it, and I know he wouldn't want to analyze it, to find the funny in something. He just knows exactly where it is. That's his brilliance. That's his talent. And to try to like rip it apart and analyze it, I don't even want to go there. Huh. So, so 16 years in, you get this call. Now it's three seasons in. When did you start getting contracts? When did they say, okay, this is a real show now. We're going to oh, make I don't Susie think some I would, money. I don't, I don't think I had a contract till season eight. Like were you not making, you were only making scale until season eight? Well, the, no, first few years I was making scale. Then I was making a little bit more, but not much. Not what people think you're making on TV. And it's also network is always different than, than cable. Um, I guess I started making money season six, season six or seven. But because I was a comedian, I was able to cash in. Because uh, my profile was so much higher, and I started making a lot of money doing personals. 
So, so like you'll go to Las Vegas and fill out a room and they'll pay you a lot of money. Yeah, not Las Vegas, not my style, but like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and and do you do do you do stand up now? A little bit here and there, mostly private, uh, corporate gigs or private gigs. I, not, I don't do clubs anymore. Like what? Like so? It's been five years since the last season, right? Uh, or no, three years? One year. One year. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we just finished. We just. I mean, this is April. We 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 wrapped out season ten in March. And season nine was a year and a half before that. What well, what do you do between seasons? Uh, well, I'm on another show on ABC called Bless This Mess. I, I had five seasons of Broad City. Oh, yeah, that's right. You did Broad City. Um, uh, stand up, live my life. Uh, I just finished the first draft of a novel, you know, like oh that. Oh, my God. What's the novel about? Uh, it's about... <laughs> It's about a woman cleaning out her mother's apartment after she dies, basically. I love that concept. Yeah. Because then each thing you find could be a story. Yeah. So yeah. plus the memories, plus what's going on in her life. Right. And it's kind of funny, but it's kind of not. And it's, it's uh, I, I stopped when my mother died. I wrote it the first draft before my mother died. Um, and then I just, then my mother died. And then I, I cleaned out her apartment. And then it was a little bit too close. So I put it away for about a year. And now I'm getting back to it. Do you think with the so much reality TV and and so you know people basically see s so many more real stories than they ever did before with YouTube, reality TV and so on. Do you think people are less interested in kind of literary style novels? I don't I have no idea what the market I'm not less interested. First of all, most reality TV is not real. Right. You know, it's, but it's people bullshit. think it is. Yeah, well, it's bullshit. Mm. Um, no, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, how are novels doing? I don't know. I heard that that, that independent bookstores are doing really well yeah. right now, which makes me happy. Yeah, particularly in New York. I mean, Barnes and Noble's essentially shut down here, and uh, it's only independent. But bookstores. now, but now, Shakespeare and Company just reopened. Yeah. You know, they used to be up the block. Um, so, I mean, I think people are still reading. Yeah. When's your book coming out? <laughs> don't even ask. It needs a lot of work. <laughs> Well, uh, rewrite, 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 and and season ten of uh, of I Curb think that's going to come out in January twenty twenty or sometime around then in in twenty twenty. What do you think is different between season ten and season nine? Do we ever see Larry getting older? <laughs> Only physically. Mm -hmm. um, season ten is uh, it's Jeff's favorite season. By the way, I don't know if you mentioned that yeah. it's Jeff's favorite season. I think because it's a it's it's kind of back to more original Curb silliness. It's a really silly season. It's so fucking funny this season. And it's just, it, it's a little more dense. The, the outlines were more dense than we were used to. It's, it seems huh. like every episode is, you know, 45 minutes instead of 30. So there, there was just a lot. They just were packing so much into each. each uh, it was a hard shoot in that way because um, it, it was a lot, of, a lot of stuff packed in. But how is it different? It's not that much different. It's different because Einstein's not there. Uh, it's we're all the same. We're all back. Um, but it's it's there's there's a through line that I think is brilliant in this season that I can't tell you. Yeah, he always has interesting like one or two through lines. The arcs, yeah, yeah like the fat wall last time. And, yeah, uh, I, when or the Seinfeld reunion when the right. Seinfeld reunion was happening, it was it was so interesting because it was meta in the same way that on Seinfeld when they were pitching to NBC a show about nothing, that was the first time I'd seen anything sort of meta in sitcoms, and it just blew my mind in the early 90s. Yeah. And it's almost the same thing in, in Curb when he had the Seinfeld reunion on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Right, right. Well, you know, there's always this reality. You know, Ted Danson plays Ted Danson, and Richard Lewis plays Richard Lewis, but I play Susie Green, and Jeff plays Jeff Green. You know, it's all... They, they, that's why people get so confused and thinks that think that we're really our characters. But... Ted Danson is not like his character, Ted Danson. <laughs> See, I, I don't One know of my what, favorite people to work with, by the way. Ted Danson? Yeah. Um, I was, I was and Cheryl. I love working with Cheryl. Oh, yeah. She's she's super funny. Cheryl and I just, we're, we're like partners in crime. Yeah, because her character also seems to basically agree with your character much of the time. Well, it's us It's us against the boys, you know, right. pretty much. <laughs> so so uh, when you were starting stand-up and you were growing up with this growing up in the stand-up world with with these great comedians like a Chris Rock or a John Stewart. And you mentioned in the book, in your book, um, how John Stewart, you were wondering, what would a network do with this guy? I was curious about that because he seems like he's funny, he's a good looking guy. Like what what surprised you about Because he was not he was so uh brilliant. I mean his stand up he was a great stand up. His stand up was great. Um 
and he was not typical. He was not your typical. He, he was he was you know edgy and and out there. Even though he was handsome, and you would have thought that he would have been a perfect sitcom guy. He wasn't going to do that. He was going to do something really interesting and off, hmm. and which he ended up doing. And so so uh, obviously in retrospect, you you could mention a lot of the guys that you you did grow up with that were huge successes. Were there any that kind of surprised you that just sort of fell off after 20 years of doing comedy or there's maybe they're still doing comedy and they're not and they didn't out of the break clubs. through yeah uh yeah there are people i was surprised that that didn't break through i'm not going to name names because i don't want to hurt anybody's feelings sure. but there are people that i was surprised didn't break through that that had that had it that were good looking men and women you know that had whatever that had the thing that thing whatever that thing is that charisma um, and there, but more times than not, if you look at it, there was maybe there was a drug issue, maybe there was an alcohol issue, maybe there was you know whatever there was self sabotage. And sometimes, going on. So, sometimes we, see, I mean, because I interview a lot of comedians here, and I see a lot of comedians here. Sometimes you, there's a little bit of a bitterness, and that could hold people down if they think other people pass the li- pass them right. in line. That's right. That almost caps where and they're going to be. Certain people just came to mind. <laughs> yeah. So so And then there's people, you know, like you think of somebody who was a brilliant comic like Greg Giraldo, you know? He died. And he died from a drug overdose. So that was another self-sabotage job. And he was a brilliant comedian. You know, so there's there's those tragedies along the way. Do you think it's true that the network's always looking for certain types? And so that's why some people get passed over? I mean, you know, yeah. like if you had a done curb, what would you, what do you think you where do you think you would have been? I have no idea. Joy always says to me, you would have gotten something else. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. You know, also, like, for example, uh, when The Nanny, when Fran Drescher was on The Nanny, and that was a huge hit. And you would have thought that they would have come to me, another, you know, uh, Jewish girl with, with a, a New York accent. They would have come to me with some development deal because that's how the networks work. If this works, then they wanted to clone it. But, you know, to them, that was an aberration that she was a female and, and, and Jewish, and, and that was an aberration to them mm. in that sense. So, yeah, you know, I always kind of felt like I was up against it, but I never liked to, you know, do sour grape stuff. I always wanted to just move forward and not have that bitterness that I've seen in so many. I think that probably helped you a lot because it probably, A, kept you open to the audience, like what you mentioned, how your manager before going on stage, and B, probably just kept you open to well, possibility. People want to work with you. You know, it, it, there, there's also the thing of do people want to work with you or not? Hmm. And when you're a pain in the ass, nobody wants to work with you. Yeah, all it takes is one, that right person to be afraid to say, oh, I'm not going to pick up the call, the phone to call Susie. I'm going to call someone else first. Right. I hear she's a nightmare or whatever. What's funny with me is people think that about me because of my character. <laughs> yeah, but also your character, like I said, is a very loving character. I find her to, to be. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's so many things I highlighted in your book. I just want to check to see if I didn't. I don't, I don't want to miss anything because there were so many. You mentioned the comedy is about paying attention, which actually you said in this podcast, comedy is about listening. But in the book, you wrote comedy is about paying attention. Same thing. It's almost the same thing. Yeah. Because sometimes I see comedians and they're not listening, but they look around the club and they notice a disco ball and they notice the paint, the paint didn't finish somehow. Yeah. And they'll be able to pull the funny they're out of the They're paying attention to the physical environment, but they're not paying attention to the audience. Yeah, that's interesting. They're not paying attention to the audience. You know, most of us, I mean, so many of us are misanthropes in our own way and we're outsiders. Comedians are all outsiders looking in. All of us felt like mis I don't want to say all of us, but so many of us, and I, because I know so many of these people personally, felt like misfits when we were kids and we didn't fit in and we were, you know, part of it is, uh, I, I was actually did an interview yesterday because I have a, a gig coming up. What's um, your gig? It's a private, you know, in a... a, a synagogue or JCC or something. And it was, they were asking me about why are there so many great Jewish comedians? Well, I think part of that in in the old days when those guys were coming up, Milton Berle and Jack Benny and George Burns and Groucho Marx, they were immigrants. They were outsiders looking at at this America that they were trying to figure out and understand. And they had a different perspective because they were immigrants. So when you're an outsider, whether you're you're black or female or uh, uh, Hispanic or whatever it is, you see the world in a different way. And um, you could, of course, you could be a waspy white guy and still feel like an outsider and, and be comedic and see the world in a different way too. But I think that that's part of it. And, and you pay attention. You see, I think immigrants paid such close attention to see how they can assimilate because they were so different. 
Yeah, and I think um, I think with Jews too, you're, it's like a foreign culture within a, a within a culture. So often Jews move here, and they don't really. And this is probably true for many um, different cultural groups, but Jews continue their age-old rituals in many cases. Like you're doing a gig at a synagogue because right. you can able to say we do this, but they do this. Right, and, right, right. And it's funny. I, I know how to connect to them. Yeah, and yeah. that's like a circuit. And and it's yeah, it's I've made a lot of money off that circuit because Jews pay for comedy. Not a whole lot of <laughs> ethnic groups pay. Um, and it's it's more. Um, it's not at us against them. It's about I understand you. I understand your world, and I'm going to spit it out to you in a comedic way, um, and legitimize it in this, in that way. Right. You know, I think I think like from way back when, and and I think that really the history of comedy in this country is very Jewish. When you look at all those guys uh, and women too, you know, from Joan and people like that, I, I think that 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 experience. And that was the immigrant and the Jewish experience. And the Jewish experience is interesting in the sense also that in Judaism, to be a, a holy person, you have to study the Torah. And to study Torah is always questioning. As my husband's Catholic. You listen to what the priest says, you don't question anything. You're not, you're not, but but to be somebody who's religious in Judaism is you're constantly questioning the writings and the words of God. And, and that's part of the culture is to constantly be questioning. That's what comedians do. Questioning, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in a polite way. Correct. <laughs> so, cause and I, that's what comedians do. I remember one time, and this is like 10, 15 years ago, I was in a business meeting with a bunch of Orthodox Jews, and I described it later to a waspish friend of mine, and he was just cracking up because he would not even, he didn't even understand how a meeting like that could be. Like, like one guy, you know, we're in the middle of this business meeting, and one guy just hits the other guy. And like, that's how they're just yelling at each other back and forth. You schmuck. Like, yeah. and, and that wouldn't happen like in most right. other business meetings, but right. that's it's like not normal. Polite. Right, it's not, not polite. polite. It's even incorrect now. But, and, I, but I, I think that those guys created comedy. Those original, you know, from the Groucho and the George Burns's and the Jack Bettys, they created what we know of as comedy in this country. But why do you think that like lack of politeness happens in, in Jewish society that leads to Jewish comedy? Well, because I, I there's a familiarity somehow. I, I think that part of it is is ingrained in what it meant to be. It all goes back to the religion. What it meant to be a religious person was that you studied and and you questioned, and that's what comedy is. It's questioning the status quo. Mm -hmm. Every you know, you're not just accepting the status quo. You're questioning it, and in questioning it, you see something different. Um, let me just see if. Uh... Uh, I have some notes here. Oh, I, by the way, I love this quote you singled out from James Baldwin. If you don't live, if you don't live, or you have to go the way your blood beats. If you don't live the only life you have, you, you won't, won't live you, any life at all. Yeah, you won't live some other life. You won't live any life at all. And I thought, and you say, well, that's the whole thing in a nutshell. And I thought that was very, very beautiful. I, that's what I try to teach my children. You know, if if you if you don't, you have to be true to yourself. Same thing with comedy. I mean, so much so with stand-up. You better be true to yourself. You can't do some. When I was coming up, you know, I would see all these male comics doing Jerry Seinfeld. They all did Jerry Seinfeld. And Jerry Seinfeld already did Jerry Seinfeld brilliantly. You know, you don't want to see. It's like find your own voice. Find out who you are. Be authentic to yourself, even if it's painful. It's always painful. Was it a gradual thing? Or was there some point where you realized, oh, I finally merged my, you know, daily self with my stage self. It was gradual. It was gradual. But did it feel good? Like as it was happening, yeah. did you sense it was happening and, yeah. and it felt yeah. good? Yeah, and, and I felt like I found my comedic voice and that I, now I know who I am on stage, but it's always evolving because I'm always changing. Yeah. So you always have to, you know, that's what I mean about stand-up. It's never ends stand-up. It's always a challenge. Well, uh, Susie Esman, thank you so much for the time we spent here uh, on on the podcast. Uh, season ten of Curb Your Enthusiasm is coming out soon. Just you have to tell me what's the name of the novel going to be. I know it's yours. I don't or, know. You know. I have a working title called Hungry Ghost. Hungry Ghost. Yes. Okay. But that's my working title. What does a hungry ghost usually refer to? I feel like I've heard that. Hungry Ghost before. is a is a it's a Buddhist character. 
that uh, it's it's this character who has a tiny, tiny little esophagus and can't get enough sustenance to feed it. And it's and it's about, you know, somebody with a bottomless pit of need mm. that can't be satisfied no matter what. Mm. I think a lot of people will relate to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and come come back on the podcast when that book comes out. We'll, all right. we'll talk all about it. <laughs> Thanks about so much also years. for the, the, the words about comedy. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. That was great. Thanks so much. Good. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.